the third in our series. And um, sorry, I just have a continue. Sorry. Um, and uh, so we'll take a bit of a pause for the month of August, but start back in September. So uh, please uh, stay tuned for um, our upcoming schedule. So today we're very happy and and um, and um, very honored to have uh, Dr. Thad stepping back um, uh, as our speaker today. Uh, Thad is a professor at the uh, Cleveland Clinic. Learner College of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University. He's also the uh, recently nominated chair of the Department of Inflammation and Immunity. Uh, Thad uh, uh, was educated both at Northwestern University and uh, Washington University, uh, where at the latter he began his uh, illustrious uh, research career. Um, uh, Thad, um, you know, has been doing fantastic work in terms of um, immunology of IBD, uh, stem cells in IBD, epithelial biology in IBD. Uh, he's made connections between some of the genes uh, that we've identified through genetics. So for example, uh, demonstrating that the ATG 16L1 variant that's associated with uh, Crohn's um, uh, impacts on uh, the host immune response, uh, sorry, the host response, uh, autophagy response to, to viruses. Um, he's made uh, connections between uh, dietary fibers um, and uh, colonic health and susceptibility pathogens. He's um, developed models of um, uh, injury repair cycles. He, uh, he's really done uh, some uh, fantastic work in terms of uh, demonstrating how the enteric virum uh, impacts on uh, epithelial function and IBD susceptibility. And he's currently leading um, a consortium project to develop and, and study intestinal epithelial lines from uh, patients with IBD. And um, uh, we're very lucky to uh, have him today uh, a, as he presents his um, uh, seminar on the intestinal epithelial defects uh, triggered by the genetics and environment uh, and how these are a target for uh, IBD therapy. So thanks so much, Thad. Great. Thank, thanks for the very kind introduction, John. I think, um, I think um, as uh, I go through this, maybe we can do questions uh, uh, sporadically throughout instead of at the end. Is, is that okay? Or how do you want to do this? It might be a little unwieldy to, to manage with uh, this number of uh, individuals. So typically what we've been doing is just going for a 30-minute presentation and then opening it up at that end. Got it. Some people need to, you know, send, um, send chat messages. Some people will, you know, will, will raise their hand. And so it, it's, it's going to be a lot easier to manage if you just give your presentation for 30 minutes and we have it open it up for discussion at that point, if that's okay. No problem. No problem. I'll, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do whatever you guys want to do. So that, that's <laughs> awesome. so. Okay. Well, great. Well, thanks. Um, it's a, uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to, to be here today. Um, and, um, yeah, as, as, as what I, um, what I'm going to focus on today is going to be epithelial, uh, really the epithelium and IBD. Um, I think epithelial targets are still, still an, uh, a, a relatively undermined uh, uh, and underutilized uh, target in IBD therapy. And um, I'm gonna um, actually just, just really, and, and, uh, I'm gonna really just talk about two stories uh, that have developed over a long period of time. And, uh, and just to keep this, uh, just to keep this uh, manageable. Um, okay, so the goal, um, the goal is really to, uh, to, uh, to think about, um, what is lost in IBD? And what is lost in IBD is this ordered, uh, ordered pattern of, of the mucosa. One of the things that's lost is this ordered pattern of the mucosa that we, that, that's the, uh, that we see uh, in homeostasis. Cut sections through the, uh, through the normal colon. You can see that it's punctuated by, uh, by these uh, crypts of Lieberkuhn that house uh, intestinal epithelial stem and progenitor cells. These are the engine of, of self-renewal uh, that basically uh, keep this, keep this uh, lining of the gut perpetually renewing. 
uh, and mice, this, uh, and this, this, this renews every about once a week in the colon and in humans, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit longer time period, but still um, uh, pretty quick. So you have cells born here uh, and then they uh, basically die out here uh, uh, in, in, in next, to the, next to the lumen in these cuffs surrounding these crypts. The key is to maintain a, a, a large number of these crypts uh, and this is really important for maintaining the barrier, maintaining a healthy gut. What happens in uh, inflammatory bowel disease as a number of other injuries is you have focal areas of very severe injury. And the se severe injury is really characterized by loss of these crypts. So you can, and, and they're lost in a, a variety of ways through either ischemia, infection, uh, or IBD. And this is the most severe, um, most severe uh, form of this, uh, of this uh, damage that we actually see. Uh, here. There are more subtle uh, defects, some, uh, one of which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but this is, I think, when people think about damage in IBD, this is what they, what they consider. And then what's, what's really important uh, is, is how, to, is, is how uh, the repair process actually works um, during, um, uh, 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 in response to this, this particular injury. And so this is an example of, of an, a repairing epithelium and some of the changes that we see. There are changes that we see in crypts. There's these expansion of epithelial stem and progenitor cells um, that, that are present. There are also changes that occur though uh, in the surface epithelial cells uh, in areas of, of damage uh, as well. You can see these flattened epithelial cells. Normally, uh, normally the epithelial cells that, that, that bind the intestine are tall columnar cells, about 30 microns. These, uh, these, these uh, wound-associated epithelial cells that we see are in the order of just a few microns tall. And these, uh, we'll talk about these in the, in the second half of these talk, uh, of this talk about what the function of these uh, cells are. So this is something, um, th th this, is, uh, th this idea of studying uh, uh, epithelial function and, and damage and repair uh, is something that, that we've been trying to model for decades. Um, this is a, pair, uh, a paper from Silen et al. from uh, 1982. This is one of the first uh, mentions of the word restitution, which is basically trying to replace epithelium um, that's been damaged. Um, they used a system where they used uh, explanted uh, uh, frog stomach. They uh, treated it with high, uh, uh, high amounts of sodium chloride, which, which killed a lot of the surface epithelial cells. Then they could keep this for um, alive long enough to see some of the epithelial changes um, that I just showed you that happen uh, in, in IBD. You can see these flattened uh, w, uh, WE-like cells on the surface of the stomach, and you can see uh, what appears to be even an expanded um, progenitor-like population here. So th th this is something that there's been a, a long interest in actually developing tools uh, to actually study. And what has really, I think, driven the field, uh, particularly in the early days, thinking about inflammatory bowel disease, was taking systems like this uh, at the bench, uh, whether this was uh, animal systems or whether this was, uh, which, whether this was cultured uh, cells, cultured epithelial cells, and trying to develop ideas that then could make it to the patient. Um, and what, um, what this drove was, was a lot of, um, I think, really great basic studies, uh, understanding epithelial function uh, in the gut. It started off with, with tumor lines. Uh, uh, those of you in the field know Keiko, things like Keiko 2 cells very well. Uh, these have been the, a workhorse of, of understanding of epi epithelial function in the gut for a long time. Uh, this was, uh, this was I, I, I think, really supplanted by the ability to grow primary cells from, uh, from mice and from, from now from humans uh, and grow them in these uh, organoid forms. Of course, this was work um, uh, pioneered by Sato and Cleavers. And this is really, uh, you know, these, these, uh, these uh, methods have been really important for, under again, understanding basic biology of intestinal epithelial cells. There are a number of, of, of animal models looking at uh, damage in the intestine. Uh, dextran sodium sulfate is probably uh, the, the, the best known to all of you. This can create areas of focal ulceration in mice. This is a, this is a section through a colon here. This is the very distal colon in the mouse. And you can see here that there's no purple crypts here. Um, this is at very low power. Um, and this is just an area of damage. Uh, my lab has also been very interested in things like using a biopsy uh, injury system to create focal injuries and then watch these uh, repair. But, but really what, what's happened over, over, over this long period of time is that these, that, these, um, that, these, you know, that these modalities really designed at the bench have been great for understanding the basics of of injury and repair and, and understanding epithelial biology, but it's been very challenging to take these to uh, to the patient. I think this is where this is where um, you know many many of us that are interested in these basic processes have struggled uh, for a long time. 
So what I think is, uh, you know, what I think that that's emerged uh, in inflammatory bowel disease and many other diseases for that matter, that's so exciting is this ability to, to actually reverse the translation. So instead of trying to just do this forward translation, uh, bench to bedside, actually starting um, with, patient, um, with patients first, understanding what's going on within the patients at a very uh, deep molecular level. Then taking these observations and then going to uh, systems in vitro and in vivo systems to understand what you've actually, uh, actually uh, begin to understand in the patients. And then hopefully use this information to go back and develop therapies. So it's this reverse translation that I think that's, that's so exciting and that I think is, that has a lot of potential for, uh, for uh, new therapies in inflammatory bowel disease. And I think the leader in reverse translation really has been the, the work that's been done and uh, uh, pioneered by uh, Judy Cho and, and many others in the genetics consortium here, uh, looking at genetic predisposition in this particular disease. Uh, this has been a concerted effort over the last, last few decades, and it's really been awesome. It has is, it is, it is really given us a, a lot of um, new ideas and, and new, um, new, ways to think about, uh, new ways to think about developing uh, really basic science um, uh, uh, investigation to try and understand uh, what's at the heart of, of, of patients uh, with inflammatory bowel disease. And uh, I think the genetics, in my mind, really uh, wraps up what's going on with the environment and then directly impacts what's going on with the various cycles of dysregulation at a cellular level that we see uh, both on the host and microbe side in these patients. So um, as John mentioned, one of the, um, I'll take you through um, uh, one, of the, one of the areas that I've been interested in for a long time. Uh, one, of the, one of the initial um, susceptibility alleles that was identified uh, uh, back in, in 2007, I believe, um, in Caucasian populations, in multiple Caucasian populations, was a SNP, uh, a coding SNP for, uh, that was present in the gene ATG1601, which is a gene involved in autophagy. Um, it's a very high value SNP, uh, but it has a very high risk of, uh, risk allele frequency in Caucasian populations. So, so it's not enough just to have this mutation. You have to have basically another hit. And in this case, we think it's an environmental hit that can, that, that, that can disable this particular uh, molecule. There's been a lot of work that's been done on this T300A uh, in, in, in multiple labs. Um, and, and including uh, Romney Xavier's group and, a group and groups at Genentech. Um, and basically the, the, the take home message is it's a susceptibility allele um, basically uh, causes this molecule to be susceptible to, uh, to essentially degradation uh, in, in times of stress. So it will become non-functional. So my, uh, my journey started, uh, started in this, uh, uh, with a collaboration with Skip Virgin's lab. Um, it, the time that, that, that the SNP was identified for ATG1601, I collaborated with, uh, with also with, uh, with gastroenterologists at Washington University, including Ellen Lee, to begin to look at um, what was actually going on in patient specimens that had this, um, this particular uh, susceptibility allele. And in the intestinal epithelium, the one cell type that seemed to be the most sensitive to this was PANA cells. And what we found initially was that patients that were homozygous uh, for this particular susceptibility allele had an altered uh, localization of, uh, uh, of, uh, of peptides that were produced by these cells. And normally they, they make uh, defensins, uh, lysozyme molecules like this that are packaged into these, uh, into these, um, into these, uh, to these structures that then get secreted uh, into the lumen of the gut. And this looked like this wasn't happening properly in these patients. So again, we didn't really understand the mechanism of what was going on here uh, uh, very early. So remember, PANA cells um, uh, secrete these antimicrobial proteins uh, and peptides. Uh, these, get, these get placed in the lumen. Um, at the time, uh, you, we were thinking that these malfunctional uh, uh, PANA cells would produce less of these antimicrobial proteins. They did in the, in the animal models um, that we made. And then the idea here is that this would, this would really alter the local ecology. Um, the idea is that there are specific microbes that can live in close to the surface of the intestine. These are able to withstand the relatively higher concentration of these molecules and survive, whereas other molecules uh, uh, normally uh, can't. So when these don't function properly, then you can you get this local uh, dysbiosis that's present at the, at, the, um, at the interface of the intestine. This is, uh, this is um, uh, from a nice review from uh, Nina Saltzman's and Chuck Bevins, basically uh, uh, summarizing uh, this particular view here. Um, Nina's done a lot of, Nina's done a lot of very nice work 
on modulating penicillin function in mice and showing that there's alterations in the microbiome. So this, again, this could be play one role here. Penicils also are, are, are very important for their function uh, as a niche uh, within the, the crypt base in the small intestine. These cells um, interact directly with intestinal stomach progenitor cells. And the, the various pathways, such as NOTCH and YAP, uh, that, the, that these cells uh, basically use these, these signaling pathways then to, uh, to interact with, uh, with uh, with their neighboring uh, stem and progenitor cells uh, and are very important during development. Uh, and also um, as Peter Dempsey's recently published during injury as well. So these, uh, these, these interactions likely not only play a role with the microbiome, but could also be playing a role with stem cells as well. So ATG1601 in the autophagy cascade uh, is, is one, of the later, uh, one of the later actors. This is a molecule that, that basically extends these, uh, the, the double, mem double membrane uh, structures, these, these uh, pre-autophagosomal -autoph structures. Um, it's a part of an enzyme complex uh, that does this. Um, th this then eventually then uh, fuses with lysosomes and then uh, degrades. Uh, its, its main function is to degrade uh, essentially uh, discarded organelles and, and things like that, but it's used in a number of other processes. Um, so the, the, the question then is, were there other genes? Was it just ATG1601 that, that played a role in abnormal penis cells? And the good news is there was work from, from, from our lab and many other labs that have identified a number of other uh, susceptibility molecules for inflammatory bowel disease that also can play a role in, uh, in this, this abnormal penis cell phenotype. So mutations in NOT2, LARC2, XPP1, and um, IRGM can also impact uh, penicillin function, as, as shown by this, uh, the, this way that we, um, we, we essentially grade penicillin by the number of granules and, the, and the, the staining pattern of antimicrobial proteins in them. This, uh, these abnormal penicillin um, are, are important for patients with IBD. If you have abnormal penicillin and you have your, uh, your, your intestine removed uh, or, par or part of your intestine removed, your time to recurrence is actually much quicker. So it's a, the idea here is that this is a much more se severe phenotype. So that this is in, this is um, this is important. But we didn't know. Um, but we didn't know really what the the environmental trigger were, was. We had had some early um, uh, uh, work with Ken Cadwell and Skip Virgin. We had some early um, early data suggesting that that there might be uh, infections with viruses, uh, at least in our mouse facility, that could trigger um, this abnormal phenotype in an uh, ATG1601 susceptible mouse. This, however, we've had um, struggles um, translating this to humans. So this goes back to my uh, forward uh, uh, translation versus reverse translation. We, we could find this in mice, but had trouble translating this exactly into humans. So what we started to do is look into humans and look for other potential triggers that might actually exist. And so reading the literature, one of the obvious trigger, potential triggers, things that make uh, Crohn's disease much worse is cigarette smoking. So we decided to take a look um, at, this, uh, at this with the hypothesis that cigarette smoking in an ATG1601 T300A host uh, could actually uh, uh, trigger this, uh, trigger hormonal panic cells. So this is work, I have to uh, give credit here, this is work I've done with Ta Chang Lu uh, uh, for, for, for many years on this particular project. And, and Dermot's been a, a, an amazing uh, colleague and, 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 and friend throughout this entire uh, process, many years of many studies. Um, but this is just summarizing um, uh, some of these ideas in, in, in a few slides. So what, um, what we found looking at patients, so these are, we started with patient studies and looked basically at this recurrence, this time to recurrence, um, whether or not pa patients had abnormal panic cells or normal panic cells, and, what, and uh, whether or not they smoked. And what was really interesting is that the patients that really had this, this, this quicker time to recurrence were the patients that had uh, a preponderance of abnormal panic cells and actually smoked. So this was this was this was really uh, really the key thing, and and so this looked um, this this looked uh, uh, interesting to us. Uh, and then this is basically just a readout of the uh, uh, on an individual basis the number of of of, of normal panic cells that would be present in a in a section. So what. Um, Ta typically does when he reads these slides out is he stains a uh, section uh, of intestine for uh, lysozyme uh, or, or, or uh, one, of the, one of the alpha defensins and then looks at the, the distribution of, this, of these proteins in individual cells and then basically uh, according to that metric I showed you 
uh, basically grades them as normal or one of the four different types of abnormal panel cells we see. So patients that have fewer um, abnormal panel cells basically have, uh, are, are associated with greater risk uh, in time to recurrence and what we would call patients with abnormal panel cells. So then what we wanted to do then, we wanted to, in, our, in our, our reverse translation mode then, was since we had this human data, we wanted to try and understand the mechanism. So this, is, this was a good chance then to go back to mice and to, and to understand uh, how this actually worked. So what we did here, we could con totally control the environment. And here, what, what we did is we basically exposed mice to, uh, to cigarette smoke um, a, a few times a day. You can set up these smoking chambers where the mice were We'll, we'll line up into these uh, little slots and then breathe uh, the, the, the cigarette smoke for a few hours a day. Once they get addicted to the nicotine, this is actually pretty easy to actually get them in these little, these little bins. And what we found is that the that mice um, that had um, uh, their homozygous for the T300A um, mutation in their genome that were exposed to cigarette smoke would have, uh, 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 have less normal panacell. So they would have in increased uh, abnormality in panel cells, much like what we saw in the human patients. We then um, could then use this system um, and then uh, carefully dissect what was going on at a, a molecular level within the panel cells, both in the mice and within the humans, and then look for, uh, for pathways that were associated with this gene plus environment uh, hit that we actually saw. So the surprises were, was, was that, that, the, that the, the, the major hits were metabolism and cell death. So the metabolism was around the PPAR pathway. So PPAR gamma um, activity was, was greatly diminished in both the humans and the mice. This could be rescued in the mice by giving PPAR agonists. And the other surprise was that the, that the panel cells, the, the real defect in the panel cells is that they were act actually dying. And they were dying by, uh, by apoptosis. And this, again, could be, in the mice, could be, uh, could be slowed by caspase inhibitors. So this panacell defect that we had been studying for quite some time was actually what we had, what we had found by having the correct uh, trigger and the, and, the, and, the, and the ability to do analysis in both the human uh, and the mouse was, was generated by this defect in metabolism uh, and, and, and that was driving uh, apoptosis. And then when you go back and look at, at, at electron mic micrographs of, of panacells cells from T300 a, a mice that are uh, smoked versus you know, wild type mice as, as controls, um, this is a, a healthy panacell cell with these, uh, with these electron dense granules that contain the antimicrobial proteins, abundant rough uh, endoplasmic reticulum and nicely polarized cell. Um, this is uh, essentially a, a, a single uh, panacell cell from, um, from a T300A mouse that's smoked. And you can see it the cell basically looks sick. The ER is uh, dilated. Um, when you go in and look care more carefully, the mitochondria are degenerating in these cells. So again, suggesting that there is a that there's a, a, a metabolic defect potentially driven through uh, mitochondrial defects. So um, so this this was a little bit of a surprise that this was this was actually at the heart of actually what was happening. So the question is is does autophagy actually have anything to do um, with this particular process? So what we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to stimulate autophagy. There's been a been a dream of being able to stimulate autophagy in these patients. Uh, and, and could we find any evidence in our mouse system uh, that would suggest that this might actually be something that would, would be worth undertaking? So Beth Levine, um, who's, uh, who's pictured here, uh, um, she's um, sadly passed away uh, a few months ago. She's um, one of the, has, has had been one of the uh, leaders in the field of autophagy for, for several decades. And she and her lab had developed this really interesting reagent um, based on a, a Becklin peptide. So Becklin is one of the inducers of, of autophagy. Normally it's, an, it's held in check by uh, being bound to this, uh, this molecule GAPR1. Uh, so it can't induce autophagy. Um, what, what happens is, is under conditions where you do induce autophagy, Becklin 1 is released. What she designed was a peptide that couldn't bind to, to, to GAPR1 and that could simply begin to induce autophagy. So you could give this peptide to my mice and stimulate uh, autophagy. The idea here is this could potentially be a therapy uh, for, for inducing autophagy. So we used our, our, our smoking model in mice um, with, uh, with the peptide, uh, the Becklin peptide or scrambled peptide. Um, and we did this uh, um, uh, in both smoked and non-smoked uh, uh, T300A mice. And so the scrambled peptide, basically you still have uh, abnormal uh, penicels. 
when you use the Becklin peptide, you can uh, rescue this particular defect. And so this is, this is seen not only for, uh, for the distribution of, of lysozyme within Pena cells, we can also see this with, uh, with, uh, with, with essentially normalization of caspase 3 positive cells, indicating the Pena cells aren't, aren't increasing uh, their cell count. So, um, so one thing we're very interested in is beginning to, 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 to understand, uh, you know, are, is there a point of no return with the smoking? Uh, can you actually uh, can you actually um, uh, get get to a point with smoking where there's a permanent defect within the, within the cells? So we're still trying to uh, to answer this particular question. Here's one um, one experiment uh, that Todd did that suggests that there may actually be a, a program defect within uh, within the epithelial cells in mice. So again, this is using uh, mice that are either T300A or wild type um, that have either been, that, and, and then we um, created organoids. Um, from non-smoked mice or from mice that had been smoked. And then we gave them, um, and, it, and, and, and all of these conditions, we didn't see anything at baseline. We didn't see much difference with panda cells. So what we gave them was, it was a second hit where we, we basically exposed them to cigarette smoke condensate to see if we could uh, trigger a defect in these uh, in, in panda cells. This didn't happen. There was really no difference in the organoids from non-smoked mice, but in the organoids from smoked mice, you can see in the T300A mice, we, we begin to see fewer differentiated panda cells, suggesting that they might be uh, might be dying here. So what this is what this is, I think, interesting. What it potentially suggests is that there's a that there's an effect here on on, on uh, the, the the ability of these cells to survive uh, in response to uh, in response to the second hit. We would love to do this in human cells. Um, one of the challenges has, has been in human organoids is actually to get bona fide panda cells, uh, something we take for granted in our, our mouse system because they're pretty easy uh, to, to produce. Uh, but this has been uh, a real uh, challenge. Tosi Sato had a really uh, interesting paper suggesting that, the, that uh, refining the condition media to include um, IGF and FGF2 uh, might be factors that, that, that will be able to produce uh, panda cells within these organoids. So I think this is a pretty ex exciting development. I still, still think it needs a little refinement, but this will allow us, I think, to go in and look at panda cells in, human, in human, uh, humans that have smoked or not smoked, uh, that either have T300A or not uh, under these conditions. So I think uh, the, 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 the journey here basically has started with uh, the genetics, uh, identifying an autophagy gene, uh, where this has led us is this led us to a connection uh, between autophagy, metabolism, and apoptosis in panda cells. Um, and then this work, I think, really nicely dovetails with a lot of other wor uh, work in the field, looking at type 1 interferons, looking at ER stress, looking at metabolism, uh, and thinking about panda cells as a def defective panda cells as a, as a source uh, potentially a, of inflammation. So we think that this is whether this is an autophagy inducer that we use, uh, we think that this is that targeting these cells, I think, in, in, in the subpopulation that has these abnormal panda cells will be a really interesting uh, therapy uh, going forward. Okay, I'm gonna take um, a few more minutes and talk about uh, just a, a second story um, um, quickly. Um, and this has to do um, with now uh, what I talked about at the beginning of the talk, which is, uh, which is kind of dealing with, uh, with, uh, with repair. And so, um, so uh, there are really two phases. So when you lose um, CRIPS and lose stem cells, there are two phases of this particular affair, repair. The first is that you get these, uh, these flattened epithelial cells that I showed you in one of the earlier slides. These are wound-associated epithelial cells. These come from stem cells that are in CRIPS immediately adjacent to the area of injury. And these will essentially form a first barrier uh, of repair. And we've shown that, that prostaglandin E2 acting through the EP4 receptor uh, within these cells is required for their formation. So the idea here is that, that these WA cells are an initial bandage uh, that, that, that forms over areas of injury, and then CRIP regeneration uh, follows uh, after this, this bandaging. And lack of protection, lack of, of, of wound-associated epithelial cells, we think will be uh, is one of, the, one of the ways that you can get uh, failure in so and just to show you uh, just a piece of data for if you lack uh, the ability uh, uh, of this uh, EP4 uh, receptor within the intestinal epithelium, these are mice that have been uh, biopsied, uh, have a small uh, one millimeter punch biopsy. And this is a view of the surface of the mucosa four days later. Uh, what's happened in the, in the control uh, littermate mice is that the wound has been covered over by these wound associated epithelial cells and is healing quite nicely. If you lack EP4, what this, this flocculent material is on top is a clot 
and you get this clot on top of the wound because, uh, because uh, of the inability to make these wound associated epithelial cells. And this wound basically won't heal. So this is, this is a paradigm that we're very interested in, um, how this, uh, this particular, um, uh, this particular uh, 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 molecule PG2 can stimulate these wound associated epithelial cells for repair. Since, um, since, our public, since the, kind of these initial observations, we've, ge we've generated multiple projects around other things that basically control these WAE cells, including uh, the microbiome, including some work in, in humans. Um, but what I wanna briefly talk to you about is, is a molecule uh, 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 that, called a TPA that allows for the migration of these WAE cells. And we think that this could be a, a therapeutic target. So coming back to uh, IB, the IBD pathogenesis model, so genetics is great, but also what's great is looking at epithelial uh, dysregulation within, uh, within IBD tissues. Uh, this, I think, is being done at a really sophisticated level by, at a single cell level, um, but I'm just going to show you a project that began a few years ago um, where we just looked essentially at, at existing data sets uh, at whole transcriptomes of, 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 of biopsies. And this was done uh, by uh, Jared Keiko, who's now an assistant professor uh, back in Australia, and Fadi Chen is uh, still a postdoc in my lab who's working on this project. So what Jared did is he took, he took uh, a existing cohorts, uh, cohort data looking at uh, involved versus non-involved areas in, 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 uh, in CD and in ulcerative colitis, and then started looking for genes that were in common with all of these data sets. The pathway that came out uh, was, was coagulation, um, which had something that, that, that hadn't, hadn't been really looked at uh, carefully uh, in inflammatory bowel disease. So we decided to go ahead and, and take a look at this. Um, we did some uh, Bayesian analysis, some kind of uh, more kind of unstructured uh, type of prediction analysis. The gene that popped out of this, uh, uh, out of this uh, analysis was a gene called serpent one or PI1. This is a molecule that inhibits TPA and, and essentially inhibits fibrinolysis. And this gene was, was upregulated in these, in these particular patients. So serpent one um, is upregulated within the or pi one is upregulated within the epithelium of most patients with, with active inflammatory bowel disease that we've looked at. So this is just looking uh, at immunofluorescence for pi one in areas of involved uh, versus uh, versus either non-involved or, or non-IBD, and there's a pretty striking distance. So basically, so the, the so the, the thing to remember here is where you have areas of damage, uh, pi one is typically upregulated in most patients with IBD. Uh, and this just shows you uh, that, that, that this is basically the stats for this is that the serpent one basically is associated with, uh, with areas of, of damage in multiple endocrine cores. I'll skip that. So this is an interesting target. Um, um, a PI1, uh, as I mentioned, is a direct binder of TPA, which is involved in fibrinolysis. Remember, IBD patients are a much greater risk for thrombosis and of hypercoagula disorders. So this is kind of, this is potentially an interesting uh, target to, uh, to, uh, to go after. And this is kind of the typical pathway that we think of, of PI1 or serpent one inhibiting TPA. This inhibits the conversion to plasmin, which then uh, typically we think of in, in affecting uh, ECM degradation. What we found that happens in, in, in IBD is that plasmin also has other targets, such as TPA, uh, uh, that can play a role uh, in, in inflammation, control of inflammation. So a couple of key pieces of data, if you knock out PI1, do a DSS injury and recovery model, essentially the, the mice do much better. Uh, they, they recover their epithelium much better. So PI1 uh, elevated in even a DSS model uh, is something that's actually uh, not beneficial to the animals. Conversely, you can look at the target of, 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 of PI1, which is TPA or, or the gene is called PLAT in mice. When you look at the PLAT knockouts in, with DSS, uh, they do much worse uh, with recovery with this particular model, suggesting that, that, that TPA is actually really required for uh, this repair. And where TPA is actually expressed is actually quite interesting. It's actually expressed within these wound-associated epithelial cells. So if you lack uh, uh, TPA or PLATS uh, and do our biopsy injury model, just like the EP4 uh, knockout that I showed you before, you basically wind up with wounds that have this big clot sitting on top of them, and, and they don't repair it at all. So it looks like um, it looks like that this that this um, that this the PI one is actually an interesting molecule to think about inhibiting. Uh, we initially collaborated with Dan Lawrence at the University of Michigan, who had developed some PI one inhibitors for lung fibrosis, and we, we tested them in our in our in our 
mouse models, our, our DSS uh, uh, injury and repair model, and found that this that inhibiting PI1 in this particular mo model uh, did have a, a benefit. So I say that we began it. We began the, uh, the, the, uh, the this particular molecule, this MDI2268, which is a PI1 inhibitor, at the time uh, where we began looking at repair, and then we could see things basically separate out. So, um, so with this, uh, I'll show you what we, how we think this works. We think that in IBD, PI1 is up, is upregulated. This inhibits TPA, which inhibits uh, uh, the ability of these WA cells to actually function. We think that there's also a role potentially in, in, in inflammation as well as, as uh, plasmin also seems to target uh, TGF beta as well, which I didn't show. So what's really exciting is as we've uh, with the, we work with the uh, Crohn's and Colitis Foundation now over the last few years, uh, looking at trying to develop novel target, novel inhibitors of PI1, um, and, and with the goal of being able to develop a gut restricted molecule for for patients with IBD. So this is something that that um, we have some nice leads on, and, and we we're we're very excited about that uh, that particular project and moving forward with that. And hopefully we'll have something to report. Uh, in the near future, where we'll have something that actually, uh, it might be something we would consider calling the patients. So with that, um, uh, I'll, I'll just wrap up this part of the talk. Um, this was a surprise thinking about the coagulation pathway, but again, using this reverse uh, 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 translational pathway, thinking about things that, are, that were upregulating the intestinal epithelium. This got us thinking about something that we probably wouldn't have uh, thought about otherwise. We then went back to animal models and showed that, uh, that, 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 that these genes actually potentially do play a role in repair. And now we're trying to go back to patients uh, with, with novel therapies to target this particular outcome. So I, I thank people as I've uh, gone along. So I think I can go ahead and uh, stop up there. Well, that's great, Todd. Thanks so much for uh, telling us those two uh, pretty exciting stories that have evolved tremendously over just the uh, last few years. So I have a couple of questions. The first one that I got uh, was from uh, Jermit McGovern. I think you know the guy. Um, people have suggested that heparin may be an effective treatment for ulcerative colitis. Does heparin have an effect on the uh, PI1 cascade? Yeah, it's interesting. It's it's interesting thinking about um, thinking about just kind of generalized uh, uh, anticoagulants, right? Um, and I, I think I think I. Th I, I think what we're looking at with PI1 is going to be different than, than trying to just um, inject heparin basically systemically. Um, the, 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 I think the concern here is, um, is you know, the danger, of course, is, 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 is bleeding. Um, I, I, think, I think the control with, it, with a PI1 TPA system, TPA system and fibrinolysis is a little bit different than, than just using and just trying to inhibit coagulation. So I think, I think this is a little bit different of a target. Great. Next question I got was from Laura McGillis. It's interesting that penicill defect caused by the ATG6 nl one mutation plus smoke exposure in mice didn't persist in the organoids without introducing the condensate. Uh, so do you think it's because of exposure to nutrients in the media allowing the uh, penicillus to recover? And is this a limitation we can expect when observing environmental contributions to IBD in this model system? Yeah, this is a great question. So, so some of this is, is we may not be, have been able to expose the mice uh, long enough. Um, so the, the, little, the, the, the little chambers that I showed you, uh, the, the, once the mice get past really 12 weeks of age, they, they get too big for the, the chambers. And they actually like breathing the cigarette smoke so much, they'll asphyxiate themselves. Uh, uh, in the chamber, so we, we can't use older mice. So so one of the one of the goals is going is going to be would be potentially to to look at, at a much longer exposure. Um, you can imagine doing this over many many months, and then looking to see then if there's something hardwired in the pan cells. So so the the limitation here is we're looking at a short window of exposure, um, and then um, and then uh, looking at the at the epithelial cells in, in culture. Um, I, I actually think it's kind of amazing that the, that there is that there is a secondary effect of the of the condensate. To me, that's that's quite surprising. So it even suggests even that that a little bit of exposure is something where there's memory within your epithelial stem cells, uh, and then that this can then be passed on to pan cells as they produce. Uh, to me, this is very surprising. Uh, super. So uh, John Braun has asked, uh, what triggers PI one, and what is the physiologic context and in inflammation? Yeah, so there are there are a lot of things, uh, a, a lot of upstream uh, uh, stimulants of PI one. So there are of a wide variety of inflammatory cytokines uh, that that can that can that can trigger this. So IL six T uh, uh, 
TNF, uh, IL-1 beta. So, so this seems to be, this seems to be um, wherever there is, there is damage in cytokine production that, that's, that's happening, uh, PI-1 will get, it will get induced. Okay, next question is uh, Nacho Gonzalez. Should this be approached? Uh, PI inhibitors work in patients with primary immunodeficiencies and enteropathy like uh, APSED, CTLA-4 deficiency, RBA? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so I, I, I know, um, so PI-1 PI one inhibitors have been, have been considered for, um, for a number of kind of chronic diseases, uh, 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 chronic kidney disease, chronic uh, 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 fibrotic lung disease. Um, I'm not aware of, 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 of immunodeficiencies. I have to think that's the first time anyone's ever asked me that question. I'll have to, uh, have to, uh, have to um, think a little harder about that one. Um, and, um, and I guess I, I, what I would want to know is what you're thinking of, about that. And, and uh, so if I can find, uh, or if Colleen, you can find Nacho. Uh, yeah, uh, that's a great question. Un unmute him. Um, uh, so I'm, I may have missed this, Thad, but you know, given the importance of the PANA cells to uh, the stem cells, um, what have you seen uh, in terms of either your, your, your cultures or, or in your animal models, how the, the PANA cells have influenced, uh, these defects have influenced uh, the, uh, the stem cell functions? Yeah, so so to, so today we um we haven't seen I haven't seen that much um that much of a defect, but I but I have to admit we haven't looked um at maybe as hard as as we need to. Um one of the challenges is in mice is we don't have great injury models for the small intestine. Mm -hmm. So we have really good we have really good injury models for the colon. Uh, there are a few um, th that exist for the, the the small intestine, and I think that that's going to be really the key is going to be able to look at the the injury in the small intestine and then the effect then on repair. And that's something um, uh, that's what I think is missing. So so we have, frankly haven't haven't looked looked as carefully as, as we need to. Um, initially, I had been very focused on the the obvious direct. Uh, uh, impact with the microbiome, but I think this 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 stem cell, you know, these these really nice papers really suggesting that there's this impact on the the stem cell through you know, pathways that, that hadn't really been considered before. Um, I, I think is is going to be really important. Fantastic. I see that Nacho has been unmuted. So uh, if you want to have your respond to Thad's question. Yeah, the, the point is that in patients with primary immune deficiencies, we had one observation is that in patients with in LRBA, we, we observed lack of panet cells. Mm. Uh, we, we don't know the exact mechanism uh, why it works. But um, speaking with Charlotte Cunningham Randalls at Mount Sinai, uh, perhaps this is a common mechanism in enteropathy in patients with primary immune deficiencies. So perhaps. Um, targeting these panet cells, we, we can um, improve something. Wow, that is, that is really dynamite. I'd love to uh, talk to you more about that. Um, it sounds very, uh, very, very interesting, actually. Um, and you wonder, wonder what, the, what the etiology is there. That's, that's super interesting. Um, yeah, we've been looking, uh, Ta has been looking, uh, he, he's part of the, uh, the Gates Foundation group that's looking at um, Looking at um, you know what's going on in, in patients with uh, you know essentially dietary enteropathies um, and uh, penta cells look like you know it, preliminarily it looks like penta cells um, have some defects there as well so that's very interesting that the, that there are these um, these immunodeficiencies and penta cell defects is this secondary to infection do you think or is this uh, is this something something else I think it's medi uh, autoantibody mediated. Okay. Driven by out antibodies, yeah. Oh, interesting. Not just simply infection, yeah. Because that, that would be the, the trivial thing would be these patients are more susceptible to infection. Um, there, there are loads of papers showing that there are penicil, uh, there's loss of penicils, um, um with, with, say, parasite uh, uh, in, infections and things like that. But autoantibodies, that's quite, you know, autoantibodies to the penicils. Uh Well, we, we, it hasn't been proven today. Yeah. So today, sorry. That would be that would be extraordinary uh, if there were autoantibodies to panic cells. That would be that would be uh, I think um, wow that would that would be a game changer. That's 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 a really interesting idea. Thank you. Thanks, Thank next you. Nacho. That's great.
The next question, is there any sex difference in panic cell number in the smoking model in vivo and in both mouse and in human organoids? Yeah, so we, we, uh, we have not seen any, any differences, uh, 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 male versus female, in, in either the human or the mouse data uh, for this particular model. So. So are there any other questions with that? If not, uh, it was a, a great presentation. Um, uh, oh, sorry, did I miss a question? Sorry, yeah, I missed a question. <laughs> um, uh, Shijuan Chen asked, uh, aero hydrocarbon receptor AHR is important for cigarette smoke. Any possible involvement of this in panacells? Ah, that's a great question. Um, it's uh, we we haven't we have looked to today. We haven't seen we haven't seen any uh, any effect on pan cells. It's a really really great question. So, but I think more goblet cells. I think that that's more that's what Romnick has published, and uh, I think uh, that we've 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 seen that effect, but not on pan cells. It's interesting. So one last chance to ask questions. Uh, going once, going twice. All right, fantastic. It was a, it was a great presentation, Thad. Um, uh, lots of uh, great things to think about. And thanks to everyone who, uh, who joined us. And uh, as I said earlier, stay tuned. Uh, we'll be sending out an updated list of, uh, of talks for, uh, for the fall. But until then, everybody uh, uh, stay happy and stay safe. Take care. Thank you.